All right, <clears throat> three o'clock by my count. Not quite the impressive turnout that Yarden got in her talk right before this, but that's okay. <laughs> good to see all of you here. Um, good to see you all on the developer track at scale. You know, kind of a auspicious part of the uh, part of the event. I think this is probably my fifth or sixth scale at this point, you know, including the ones before our little uh, two-year off-the-road event there that happened. Um, and I've had the chance in my career to work, you know, as a developer writing code. And also I've worked on the uh, architecture side and on the tech leadership side. And really this part, the development, the code, I think is still what I most closely associate with joy in my career. You know, and that's just me. Um, don't get me wrong, I love hacking around on a Linux box or messing with a Raspberry Pi or setting up some bit of federation or connective uh, connective uh, integration tissue, but I think just sitting down and writing code, like really creating something from whole cloth is, uh, is something that I find uh, gives me the most joy. And we're going to talk about joy today specifically, uh, developer joy, and developer joy's uh, inextricable link to developer productivity, right? At uh, Gradle, we don't really see a difference between productivity and, 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 and joy. Right, with a developer, we see them as being sort of the same thing. And so the approach that we take, developer productivity engineering, focuses on this, right? Dopamine, right? The feedback cycle, the satisfying work that we get to do. So you can imagine <clears throat> these kids are, you know, going through what a lot of us might have gone through early on in our careers while we're learning how to code, uh, and they're experiencing this flow kind of for the first time, right? This special kind of creativity that comes with writing software. And it is unique. It's this beautiful blend of both scientific and creative right brain and left brain activity. And that's just not speculation or anecdotal, right? Uh, the brain has been mapped while coding is taking place, right? You should see these experiments. They're, they're, they're very interesting and they represent this sort of cognitive left brain, right brain soup of activity that is ecstatic, frankly. So, so put yourself in the shoes of these kids. They, they type system out, print lint, hello world, boom. Hello world popped out on the screen. Yes. Wow. Now, I want you to imagine that these kids are waiting 10 seconds, a minute, an hour, 10 hours, 20 in some of the more extreme cases that we've seen to get that feedback back from the tool chain, to get that necessary a uh, bit of feedback that says, yes, you did what you were supposed to do, and, and I'm giving you the, the reward for your work, all right? If they're waiting that long, like many enterprise developers are waiting for that type of feedback, they're not gonna look like this, they're gonna look like this, and they are going to go and find another hobby. All right, uh, so who am I? Uh, for those of you who I haven't met or spoken to before, I have been on the conference circuit for quite a long time. Uh, my name is Justin Riak. I'm the field CTO and chief evangelist at Gradle. Uh, my background is primarily in software development. I wrote code for a long portion of my career, uh, moved into more enterprise architecture than sort of leading those teams, and then somehow found myself doing more PowerPoint than anything else and kind of going around to, uh, to these talks. And I just built Gradle's first advocacy team, which I'm very proud of. Uh, some familiar faces in the JVM community will be working for Gradle now. Those of you who may know Trisha G from uh, in, uh, IntelliJ or Baruch Sadogursky from JFrog or Brian Demers, they've all just recently joined uh, in the advocacy work that we're doing around developer productivity engineering. So, uh, very exciting work, obviously something that's uh, near and dear to me. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what, how we got here. You know, why Gradle and developer productivity engineering? What is it? And then specifically, how does this practice help and lift
what I'm talking about. All right, we can do so much better than this for our developers. Now, for some of you who may not be developers, I realize that this is also a very DevOps-friendly conference. Think on the other side of this. Maybe you're responsible for an integrated CI environment, right? Maybe your job is to serve the developers who are using that integrated CI. Maybe they're building way too often because they're leaning on CI to do the builds because the builds are so clunky and, 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 and expensive that they can't be done on their own laptop or they have to do it in a remote workstation. Maybe those tests are failing a lot and they're opening up tickets because they don't know. The developers aren't sure whether it's their fault or something with the CI infrastructure. And even if it only takes you five minutes to answer that ticket and say, no, this is your fault, go fix it, that's five minutes you can't get back. That's five minutes that your flow has been interrupted. All right? So these problems, they don't exist just in the developer experience. They cascade out. They impact CI engineers as well. And this doesn't have to be our reality. This one's getting a little long in the tooth. <laughs> I like some of the newer ones that have come out, uh, like this one. Yeah, installing dependencies, right? Why else are we slacking off? Uh, training, my model's training right now. Yeah, that's a, that's a new legit one. Uh, chat GPT's down, yeah. <laughs> I think that's the one of our, of our times. Uh, of course, testing, my God's testing, wow. We know that something like 90% of enterprise build cycles are held up in test. Right. So, not to put too fine a point on it, but what are we solving? Well, if you can imagine that this is a developer and that these are feedback cycles, the basic building block of developer experience, right? And sometimes things are fine, right? Sometimes they take too long, right? We hit on that already. Sometimes it takes too long to fix, all right? A build going red doesn't immediately pull a developer out of a state of flow nor does it immediately trigger a developer to open up a ticket with a CI engineer. But if 20 minutes later, you're still hunting for the data that you need to solve that problem, you're not in flow state, you're frustrated, and you're probably opening a ticket, okay? And then this one. This is the real bane. The problem that could have been observable if we'd been proactive with our analytics, if we'd been paying attention to failure trends, if we'd been detecting flaky tests, then we could have proactively done something about this problem before a developer even encountered it. So that's why we think of this practice as really being the next big thing after DevOps. Now, you could absolutely stick platform in the middle. In fact, if you look at the way that highly productive organizations who are practicing DPE have evolved, if you look at a Netflix or a LinkedIn or a, or a, 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 you know, a Spotify, right, one of these companies that's really doing developer productivity right, if you look at the career path that they've set up for the folks that have evolved into this practice, a lot of them were SRE or doing Agile. And then they moved into DevOps. And then they became platform engineers. And then they went from platform engineers to productivity engineers, right? And it, but it's a really easy progression why this happens. Think about the primary bottlenecks, right? Think about far right. What was the stuff that we were solving with DevOps, right? Bottlenecks in the release. Who remembers? the USB artifact sneaker net, where you would compile the artifact on your computer and copy it to a USB drive and walk it over to the QA team and they would install it in their environment and test it, right? <laughs> we were doing this, right? Who remembers racking a $10,000 server to put a single app on it that only used 1% of the CPU, right? These were the problems that we looked at originally to solve and DevOps has done a great job with that. And these are all rooted in the same theories. Anybody familiar with the goal, the theory of constraints, the Phoenix Project, if you've read that, right? I mean, these are sort of like the thought manuals for DevOps, but they're all just about removing bottlenecks in the value stream. That's all they are, right? And if you look at what's happened, we've just moved uh, the, the primary bottlenecks further and further left. DevOps didn't do everything that it could have done for developer experience. Platform is starting to do it, DPE is absolutely clearing this next set of primary bottlenecks, and that's why we think it is quite literally the next big thing in software development. All right, I am not going to get caught up in this quagmire of a slide, uh, especially because it's very blurry. Uh, the thing to be aware of is that we're very intentional uh, in the types of bottlenecks and pains and impediments to developer joy that we're focusing on, right? I think we've already talked about fast feedback cycles, 
We're going to talk about how we achieve that in a minute. But also faster failure troubleshooting, more reliable builds and test sets, uh, having better metrics, and actually just data. Who here has any idea how long local builds are taking for your developers on their workstations, on their laptops? Anybody tracking that data? No, don't feel bad. Nobody is. But it's one of the most important quantifiers for how your developers are actually feeling and how they're actually doing their jobs. So we're going to talk about what metrics are important there and a little bit about how they relate to some of the other popular metrics that have sprung up in this space. How does DPE augment space framework? How does DPE improve DORA metrics? Right? We'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, and then finally, how does all this make CI cheaper? I mean, it's not so much about productivity. I mean, certainly if developers aren't waiting as long for CI jobs to complete, they will theoretically be more productive. But because all this work avoidance is taking place, because we're actually reducing the amount of work that's done to complete a build, we're making your CI resources cheaper too. Think about flaky tests in CI. What are developers doing to diagnose those? Run, 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 run. Oh, it finally went green, good, I'm done, right? But how many redundant builds got scheduled in your CI pipeline from that one test? And if you multiply that by 500 developers, how much, how much wasted work is going on in those CI agents as a result of an inconsistent build uh, tool chain? All right, so let's actually dive into it. And, and by the way, really, do stop me questions at, at any point. I, I, I would love for this to be interactive. Oh, God, this projector. Um, so when we introduce faster feedback cycles to, uh, to a team, some obvious things happen, but some not so obvious things happen too. And I'll do my best to kind of traverse this knowing that it's really hard to read. I, I apologize. You will get the deck. Actually, the deck is already available, attached as a PDF. Um, so faster feedback cycles. Well, there's the obvious stuff. This says less idle wait time. Great. What does that mean? It means less context switching for our developers, less switching focus between running the build and then go trying to catch up on some email or something like that while they're waiting for that 10 minute, 15 minute, 20 hour long, whatever build to complete. Uh, look. Over the last decade, there's been really compelling data in neuroscience that suggests that human beings are completely incapable of multitasking. Right? We, 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 we convince ourselves that we are multitasking, but we really are not. We are rapidly shifting between contexts and tasks. More recent data within the last couple of years has actually said that forcing our brains to context switch is deleterious to our executive functioning. It leads to a buildup of glutamate in the prefrontal cortex of the brain, which leads directly to cognitive fatigue, right, and stress. And when we have that cognitive fatigue and stress, we can do our jobs, but we can't elevate our jobs. We don't have the wherewithal to really innovate and really elevate our work and really actualize our capability. So we end up with more focused developers, healthier developers. I'm working on a whole new set of messaging around DPE that's aimed at HR professionals and people who are interested in wellness, right? It's not even a technical talk, right? We're talking about reducing the stress and the exhaustion of your workload and making them healthier and hopefully retaining them. What about the not so obvious things? Well, when developers' build speeds go from 60 minutes to 30 seconds, they tend to build more often and introduce smaller change sets in doing so. If I know that it's going to take an hour for my build to complete in CI or whatever, you better believe I'm going to cram a bunch of stuff in there. And then if something breaks, it's going to be harder for me to debug and figure out what change actually caused that. Or if I merge that change, there's a way higher uh, possibility that this is going to lead to a merge conflict at, you know, post merge because of the size, just the footprint of the changes that I've made. But if I'm able to operate on a 15 second cadence for my builds, something that doesn't force me to context switch, and that I can keep doing my work, I will refine my work more often. I will run my builds more often, which leads to smaller change sets, fewer merge conflicts, and more efficient troubleshooting, which has a direct impact on MTTR quality and productivity. Okay. Little math behind this that's a little surprising. Um, take a look at these two separate teams. Uh, this is actually real production data that came from a trial that we did. This is the same business, two separate teams. Um, this first team of 11 developers, these were both uh, Android mobile, mobile teams, had a four-minute build time. 
and they were running roughly uh, 850 local builds a week. This team of six, just slightly bigger than half the size of this team of 11, with a one minute build time, is building over a thousand times in that same span of time. They're refining their work more often than this team that's almost twice their size because their build times are lower. One thing to point out, who would ever complain about a four minute build time, <laughs> right? But it's problematic. These shorter ones are even weirder if you think about it because that five minute time is like, just it's not quite enough to go off and do something else. I mean, at least the, the, the upshot of a 20 hour build is that you have 20 hours, all right? I mean, yeah, you're context switching, but probably only twice, right? Not like every 30 minutes or whatever. But a five minute build, ooh, that's, that's that, that's that space right in the middle that's so toxic because you really can't do anything during that time. So we recommend multiple acceleration technologies. And you know, obviously, again, I mentioned that we have a solution for this. But my, my advice to you is to look at your own tool chain and see what similar solutions are already available to you. Right? I'm going to talk a lot about Java JVM. That's where we live at Gradle and with the other build tools that we support, like Maven and SBT and, and Bazel. Right? But there are absolutely build caches uh, in CMake, for instance, or Clang. Right? Uh, I, I know that one of the, I want to say, it's not Webpack, but it's another one of the JavaScript based build tools, not NPM, one of the newer ones, Dino related. Uh, it has a build cache, right? Predictive test selection is starting to really blow up. Was that a question? Oh, no. Um, predictive test selection is really starting to blow up. We're going we're gonna to get into this. It was you know, academically released back in 2019, but you're seeing heavy productization of this now, and it's really working. Uh, test distribution as well, we're going to talk about what that is. And then ultimately performance continuity. This isn't a one-shot deal. You can't just go through once and make your build faster and that it's going to be that way forever, right? Next week you could introduce a new version of an annotation processor and suddenly your build times are doubled, right? Or you upgrade your endpoint security on your remote worker's laptops and their builds are taking twice as long. And if nobody's tracking this, guess what happens? Nothing. Right? Okay. So first technology, build cache, build caching. Uh, if you take one thing away from this section, know that a build cache is not a dependency cache. So if your mind immediately went to, oh, we already do Artifactory, we already do Sonotype Nexus, something like that, we do GitHub Actions, this is different. Okay? This is actually caching individual phases and steps of your single artifact build. All right? so, so phases in a single step of a build. So for instance, the Maven build tool is broken up into phases called goals. And all of those goals have specific inputs that come in and then specific outputs that get created. Usually a file tree of compiled classes or, or unit test uh, results, but something that's going to be, be put back into the finished artifact, right? What a build cache does is actually creates a key from those inputs that come in per phase and then caches the output of that chunk of the artifact so that the next time the build runs, even if it's running clean, if the inputs to that phase of the build generate the same cache key, we're going to pull that chunk of the artifact from cache as opposed to actually rerunning that phase of the build. Right? This alone on highly modular Maven builds has reduced build speeds by 90% on its own. Just this one thing. Uh, Netflix had a back-end, uh, like a back-end Java API. Uh, it was taking like 63, 64 minutes, something like that to build. With two technologies, caching and test distribution, we brought that build down to less than four minutes. That's fundamentally changed the way that that team can work on that bit of logic. Now, there's a whole blog article about this. Um, Danny Thomas is the platform slash productivity engineer at Netflix who uh, told us about this use case. But, I mean, again, really think about that. Here's a team, here's Netflix, right? This isn't, you know, Joe's Crab Shack, no offense if you work at Joe's Crab Shack, but this is, this is Netflix. And they were dealing with a 63 minute long build time, right? And they, they, are, they are absolutely thought pioneers in, in productivity engineering. But if you can imagine how much different the job of that team is now, that they're waiting, you know, this less than five minutes versus, versus over an hour. Um, they are complementary to dependency caches though. So this isn't a mutually exclusive thing, it's more like a collectively exhaustive thing. Uh, you definitely want to use artifact uh, management and artifact repositories to improve this part of the build, which is usually dependency resolution and download, plus pretty helpful these days with open source supply chain security. Uh, but, uh, but this is still, this is different. 
Uh, just kind of an illustration again. The inputs come into the certain phase of the build, whether the Gradle task, the Maven goal, the Bazel target, the SBT action, whatever it is, and the output that gets generated gets stuck in a cache against the key. Uh, again, we're, we're basically just making a hash out of all these different types of inputs, like in our case, the source code files, the JDK major version, class path, and then creating a cache entry out of, in this case, like a file tree of whatever got created in that phase of the build, right? Uh, and this is pretty much what it looks like. Are all tasks and goals cacheable? Absolutely not. IO driven ones, you know, ones that are meant to create, you know, whatever new bytecode on the fly. No, no, those will not be cacheable, but a lot of stuff is. Like for instance, test source files, the runtime class path, uh, check style and source files. So uh, I'm gonna run through this a little bit quickly in the interest of time. Um, but effectively, I'm just gonna take you through a couple of uh, quick scenarios in which caching can kind of help us. Uh, so can, if you could pr uh, pretend that we've got either a Maven project over here, Gradle project over here, consisting of four kind of sub-modules. And uh, the way that the dependency chain works is that the core module over here is dependent upon by support API and also the service module. The web app module depends on service. Nothing depends on web app and nothing depends on export API. Okay? So in a normal scenario, in either a Maven uh, build, any old Maven build or a Gradle clean build, all of these things would have to run, right? These are all steps in the build, like this is the compile task, this is compiling the test, this is running the test, this is check styling the code. Okay, so in a normal circumstance, every single one of these things would have to run without any type of caching turned on. But what about if we have caching turned on and we make a change, relatively innocuous change, to a public method in the export API module upon which nothing depends, right? Well, we can pull all of this stuff from cache. We don't have to run any of these steps. We only have to run these, right? Because when we go to these steps, when we try to go to the service step or the web app step and we do a compile, we're gonna just generate the same cache key that we generated last time because nothing has changed, right? Now weird stuff can happen, you know, if you're generating source code and you're sticking timestamps in there, then of course you'll never have a match and, you know, there is optimization that has to happen. But out of the box savings can be really good. All right, what about public method in the service module upon which web app depends? Well, we have to do everything for service, but we don't have to check style our web app because we didn't change this code, right? We do have to recompile the test because we changed a public method in a dependent module and run that test, but we're at least saving here. And we don't have to do anything with core and anything with export API, all right? Uh, what about an implementation detail of a method in the service module? This one even uh, more innocuous because we haven't changed a public method. Uh, so, was that a question, Omer? Yeah. That's a good question. So the question is, does this set up uh, uh, presume a, a mono repo? I would. I mean, I would say no, it, it really, because this is one project. You know, this is a multi-module project. So def technically a mono repo, I'd have like a bunch of different projects in here. Uh, it's certainly an interesting subject around productivity though. I encourage you to go see what Meta Facebook has been doing with their crazy mono repo. They have like literally all of their products in one repo. Oculus, Instagram, WhatsApp, the Facebook web app, the iOS apps, the Android apps, and they've got this crazy modified version of the buck build systems that they used to make. It's really interesting what they're doing. But to be clear, in this, in this example, this is just one, everything's in one repo. One repo, one project. Yeah, four modules. Yeah, cool. No, it's a good question, Omri, thanks. Um, all right, so, uh, so yeah, when, when we change just the implementation detail, we don't even have to recompile the test because we haven't changed a public method. We can just run the test, check style, and then run the test of the dependent module. All right, you see a theme emerging here. We're gonna jump ahead. Even in the most uh, sort of invasive change that we could make with this dependency chain set up, um, you know, changing a public method in the core module, we can still save a little in that the web app and service and export API sections don't have to run their check style. Okay? Great. Um, if you're curious, we had a long video about the Maven build cache and how it works here. I don't see any phones coming up, so I'm gonna move forward. Um, I love QR codes in presentations though, because I can really say like, oh, people are actually interested in that. Um, all right, so we talked about build caching. That's the first you know, leg of the performance stool, I guess. Um, the second one is uh, test distribution. So remember that build caching 
can eliminate the need to run some tests also. If you recall from the, the slide that I showed that said here are some of the things that can be cached, unit tests were included in that, right? Which means that caching can give us the ability to not select or skip or not run certain tests that were probably not impacted by the code changes that were made. But what if we do have to run them? What if we've legitimately made changes? And what if we're like an Apache Kafka with like 20,000 tests? You know, that's, 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 that's a long time to wait for those tests to execute serially. And by the way, Kafka does have like something like, I want to say like 22,000 tests right now. And they are, they are looking into DPE te technology to make this stuff better. So test distribution. Um, it's, I mean, it's actually, it's not, it's not really rocket science. Uh, I would say it's um, an evolution of like a CI fan out style technique. So for those of you who, who, who may not be familiar with CI fan out, uh, it's a popular technique to manually partition sets of tests into small chunks of tests and then direct your CI to run those chunks in parallel, right? So that you're then executing those test sets faster, right? And that's better, but it's bound to CI. You have to manually partition those tests yourself and you have to figure out how to reconcile the results and report on the results of those tests, right? So it's, it's a little clunky. Test distribution actually just just, uh, we, we argue that it's better to integrate rather than at CI, you should be integrating at the build tool level. The problem is that the build is boring and nobody knows anything about the build, right? And I know who, who writes my checks, but this is the truth, right? Mo most developers just want the build to stay out of their way. So they haven't spent a lot of time diving into it. So the first instinct when we're trying to improve something in the tool chain is to try to build something into CI because we know that better. But the truth is it's way more efficient if you can do it at the build tool level because then it works on your laptop, it works in CI, it works in a remote environment, it works anything that can execute the build tool. It's way more flexible. Uh, single machine parallelism is another like comparable solution running these tests in parallel but of course you have the limit of running into a system limit on your laptop. I already said CI fan out doesn't really solve the problem in the same way. Um, so if we look at the existing solutions that we have for this type of thing, trying to run tests in parallel, um, the state of the art is not all that great, right? Build caching is, is, is good when, when we legitimately can not have to rerun those tests, but what about when we've made changes that actually have, that trigger legitimate impact to the test set? Uh, and, and single machine parallelism just always has limits. And even with an M2 Mac, right, you're still gonna run into a limit. And then CI fanout doesn't help during local development, build local, right? Uh, and, uh, and, and it, it doesn't work well with ephemeral CI agents, without a build cache, blah, blah, blah. All right, and then the final acceleration feature, and then we are gonna talk about how all this relates back to, um, to your open source communities, uh, because it is very special, the things that can happen with an open source community in particular uh, with, with this practice. Um, so predicted test selection, the final acceleration technology. Um, this is gonna be big, okay? Um, not just optimistically because we have a product, but uh, big because, you know, if the analysts are looking at some of the most obvious ways to use AI to improve uh, software testing. Test set optimization is what this one says right here. And then optimal test selection, all right? And predictive test selection falls somewhere right in between these two things. And the nice thing about it is that, and by the way, test insights and things like this are also part of DPE that we're gonna talk about, but for right now, for the, for the machine learning part of this, the analysts are all already predicting that this is how we're going to be looking at kind of the next phase of test optimization. Um, it was, we did not invent this. Um, Google and Facebook uh, kind of came out of their, you know, their fever swamps, uh, and they released it in an academic paper in 2019. Um, talking about the practice and actually with blueprints on how to build the learning model. Uh, effectively, <clears throat> you know, a test build or run recommend a test set that, that they think has been impacted. So at this point, we're looking at traditional test impact analysis, right? Just incremental impact analysis. What's, what's, what's related directly in my dependency graph to, to what I've changed from a testing perspective. We run it through the model and the selection model says, you know what, based on a history, of changes that have been made in the past and the way that they impacted tests in the past, I'm gonna give you a predictive score. How likely is this test to change its feedback from the last time it ran based on the current scenario, the current context? And the model says, all right, well, 99% possibility that this test is just gonna succeed. 
So and here's where things get a little scary. Don't bother running it. Pre-merge <laughs> while you're making small incremental changes on your laptop. Right? But, but listen, we already do this anyway, right? We already shut off massive sets of our tests that we don't think are going to be impacted by the changes that we made. Right? We already do this, right? This is just allowing a machine learning model to automate that process for us. And it tends to be a little bit more accurate because it's based on a lot of history that we just can't reconcile all at the same time. Uh, an interesting thing about this model, too, is not a deep learning model. So it's not like you have to throw some heavy you know, NVIDIA GPU next to your build tool chain or whatever. It just uses a regular old CPE called gradient boost uh, machine learning model. And we're seeing, um, you know, a lot of effectiveness. This is the Micronaut Foundation. MNF, who's familiar with Micronaut? Yeah, okay, they're one of the open source partners that, that we have. Uh, they're using our DPE solution uh, for free. And you can see that just in the last uh, week, um, the, they have been able to uh, uh, enable test selection on over 24, uh, 20 percent of their, or sorry, 20,000 tests, um, and 40 percent of them we were able to skip, uh, saving serial time of 14 days and two hours over just the last two weeks. Now that is serial execution time, right? There's a parallel in there. We have to divide by whatever it was a 4x scale, then wall clock time on that, you know, would be 14 divided by four, but that's still a significant amount of time. Right, the, the Micronaut Foundation is running a lot of builds, right? So they're already seeing really significant savings from, from using PPS. So we already talked about this one. This is performance insights, right? Yeah, question. Great question. Um, we have something close to that, which we kind of recommend. So when we, when we built this solution, uh, the wisdom that was given to us was that developer trust needs to be the first class citizen in this design because you're asking developers to skip tests and that's a lot, right? So we built a simulator and you're seeing the usage part of the dashboard here, but I'll show you where you can, where you can look at some of the simulations. And the simulation has effectively said, these are the tests that we wouldn't have selected, but this was the actual outcome, right? So we were wrong and it's not on the screen, but, we, but, you, but it generates a confidence factor. And so what a lot of people do is they turn the simulator on, they let it train for like a month, and when they're comfortable with the confidence factor, up in usually around that 96, 97% confidence, people are pretty happy with that, it's worth the trade-off, um, then they actually turn, the, turn it on. Uh, and, it's, and it should be, whatever implementation you work with should be granular too. You should be able to say, I only want to apply, you know, PTS to, to like this set of tests, you know, because you can, you can maintain that flexibility. Um, I thought that I had linked a QR code to the research paper for this, uh, but it's actually super easy to find if you just Google Meta Facebook predicted test selection 2019. It's, there's a big academic paper that came up that talks about all the, the nuance of this. So, um, you know, one of, the, one of the issues that they ran into was trying to train their model against tests that were flaky. They couldn't get their confidence up about 80%. So as I'll show you on our test insights, another thing that DPE organizations should be doing is detecting and reporting on flaky tests. So we were doing that, so we were able to filter those out of the training set, and that's how we were able to get the confidence up so high. Um, okay, yeah, DPE organizations track, build, and test times. What you're looking at here is a representation of about a week's worth of uh, individual builds, uh, and we can see here, Every single one of these bars represents one build, whether that's a CI agent, whether that's a developer, but we're painting a picture here of what developers are actually experiencing, right? And we're able to notice trends, right? These little circles are the actual build time, right? The, um, uh, the blue is the serial execution time. You're not seeing uh, avoidance savings in here, uh, but effectively these are wall clock and this is serial execution, right? But the point is, and there's a great quote by Yogi Berra, which is, you can observe a lot just by watching. The point is that we should be watching this stuff, right? And it's not hard. It really is not hard. I mean, we, Grubhub, um, they're shameless, right? They, we have a build, this thing called a build scan that I'll show you in a little bit that's free. It's like a freemium thing that's part of our open source tooling. And um, they shamelessly run that thing like 3,000 times a day in their own CI tooling. Um, and they also, uh, uh, have their own mechanism where they push uh, build times and Gradle off to like some Grafana dashboard. But they've effectively, they're doing the same thing. And that's, that's all I'm asking you to do, really. I mean, if you come out of here tracking one new metric today, make it local build times, really. Because as soon as you start doing that, you're not gonna be able to unsee it. You're gonna be like, oh my God, my developers have been dealing with this for so long, you know? And it'll become a priority. Um, 
All right, what about builds and tests taking too long to fix? All right, we talked about them taking too long. What about taking too long to fix? Uh, we need improved troubleshooting, right? Even now in 2023, most troubleshooting, especially in large uh, enterprise organizations with builds, starts with an expensive and long game of 20 questions, right? Especially in these crazy ephemeral CI environments that we're building now. I mean, what's always number one? Well, can you reproduce the problem? Ugh. That's a nice way of throwing the ticket away or, or kicking the can down the road. Come back to me when you can reproduce the problem, right? No, no, that's, we can do better than this. And all we need to do is gather data that we're not currently looking at in a build. There's a whole bunch of forensic data that takes place during a build that we could be capturing, like a full dependency graph and the console log. And we should be able to take that data and compare it across multiple builds. So we could say, okay, this build took 15 minutes. This one took 30 seconds. What's the difference? Right? So we've built that capability with what we call a build, what we call a build scan. Now again, I promise you this is not a product pitch. Um, what, if you come and look at this interface, I want you to use it for inspiration. I want you to look at the data that's being captured, and I'm, I'm gonna give you, you're gonna have like 17 open source dashboards that you'll be able to dig through after this talk if you're curious about this stuff, uh, that you can use for reference. Like this is, the canonical data set that should represent a smooth troubleshooting experience for anybody who's trying to uh, troubleshoot a problem with a build tool chain, right? So you can really use this for inspiration. Now these are, they're totally free, scans.gradle.com, they work for Gradle, they work for Maven. If you haven't run one before, obviously I recommend it. But you can also look in the um, free dashboards that we've set up, the open source ones, are, uh, and, and you can see tons of these rather than having to, to run your own. Finally, problems that just should have been observable. So that was, these were the ones where developers didn't even need to experience this pain. If we had just been a little bit more proactive using analytics and, and, and some other means of, of, of prediction. In other words, we want to eliminate avoidable failures for our developers. And one of the best ways that we can do that is just by tracking and aggregating failure behavior. Now some of us are starting to do this in CI, which is better, but we're not getting the full picture unless we're doing it locally and in CI, right? And you need to combine that data. That's why, again, it's so important to gather this data at the build tool level and not at the CI level. If we're able to, for instance, aggregate up that this single failure, this single build failure right here, impacted 18 users over the last week, this is meant to be a, a week's chunk of time, and 240 hosts, then we get ourselves out of the all too common scenario where the one loud angry developer gets all the attention in terms of fixing the tool chain, right? Now there's data to say, oh no, if I have an hour to improve my build tool chain, what should I focus on, right? Right now that's a hard question for most of us to answer honestly and with data. But with this type of data, we're able to say, oh, well this, fa this failure right here seems to be impacting the most developers and wasting the most amount of time, so this is how I'm gonna spend my hour and I'm hopefully gonna eliminate the possibility of other developers encountering this failure going forward. Now, if I'm a developer, my life is better, happier, more consistent. If I'm a CI engineer, I'm fielding less tickets, right? This is all self-service stuff to the developer, right? The build scans, the ability to look proactively at failures that are being experienced by developers, this all relates to less tickets. We made a massive donation um, that's public this quarter to Apache Software Foundation. We donated a large instance of our server uh, to the CI team. For those who know uh, Drew and Gavin on the ASF CI team, uh, they're who we're partnering with there. Um, we're gonna roll this technology out to like 400 some odd Apache projects. The irony, Apache Maven will be building against Gradle Enterprise, which I love. Um, but it's the CI team that latched onto this donation. Not the developers, right? because the CI team is responsible for almost 400 top level open source Apache projects feeding into their one CI infrastructure. They field so many unnecessary tickets. And that is exactly why they're so excited about this. They're seeing this significantly reducing their workload. And of course, dealing with flaky tests. How do we deal with them today? Like this. Try it again, rerun it, rerun it again, ignore it and improve the PR anyway. <laughs> So, a couple of problems here. First of all, that's like five builds, right? Could have been one. So that's gonna create uh, unnecessary bottlenecking in the CI agents. Uh, you have definitely 
I wouldn't say definitely. There's a high likelihood, a good to fair chance that you have introduced or let linger a bug, right? Um, Spotify has a wonderful paper that they did on flaky tests where they call flaky tests the black pit of sorrow for developers. <laughs> because if you think about it, what problems does it, does, it, does it cause, right? I mean, not only is it a time sink, you know, trying to uh, dig into this and figure out why is this test flaky, but developers can't trust the tool chain. So there's an inconsistency problem too. And again, most developers are too busy to do much about it, so they just end up with, oh, it went green, we're good, right? But that's a bug, right? That's going to, to impact, um, uh, impact uh, um, uh, software quality, okay? So we need to deal with this. Now there's a lot of ways that we could be detecting flaky tests, right? We just we aren't really doing it as an industry, right? I mean, if you think about the cache keys, for instance, right? So what does that build caching is doing? It's looking at the inputs to that section of a build creating a hash, right? Well, it knows if the hash it just created was a test, and it knows if the test under that same hash key, under those same conditions, ran twice and succeeded once and failed another time, that's flakiness. We can record that, right? It's more invasive, but what, what's another pop, popular solution sometimes is to just build a plugin into the build tool chain that reruns the test. So if the test fails, rerun it. Now, it's a little bit more expensive, but under the right conditions, it can detect a lot of flaky tests proactively, so in the long run, you end up in a, in a, in a, better, in a better situation. But the point is really that we need to do this as an industry. NDP organizations analyze flaky tests. In fact, uh, the, the folks at Netflix, the Uber folks, our own uh, Gradle build tool engineers and Gradle enterprise engineers, they schedule what they call flaky test days, where they open up this dashboard and they just start at the top, sort by flakiness, which tests have been the flakiest over the last you know, month or whatever, and just eliminate, 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 eliminate. Yeah. All right. And then of course all of this improves CI. You know, like we said, we so suddenly your, your builds are happening faster and your uh, builds are happening less often because people are scheduling less redundant builds because the tool chain is more consistent and your agents are healthier. Does this always happen? No, because of the first problem that I said, problem, quote unquote, uh, that this behavior may actually cause developers to build more often. But that's way more efficient use, right? You're getting way more value out of those builds than when they're just wasted cycles. Okay, <clears throat> so open source and open source projects. Well, contributing to an open source project should be as painless as possible, right? I mean, you're doing a good deed. You're doing something altruistic. You know, but how many times is it 4.30 in the afternoon, you're like, I think I'm gonna play with this thing. And all of a sudden it's eight, and you've been building it, and it's been, you've, the build's failed like six times, and it takes like an hour to fail. And you're not feeling too altruistic after that, are you? You're like, all right, you know what, I got other stuff I could be doing here. So no good deed goes unpunished. And it kind of blows my mind, uh, the state of a lot of the more popular open source projects that are out there. The reason that I picked Kafka is because it's a horrible experience to work on. It's a great product, it's a great product, but it's a, at least a 55 minute build time on my M2 Mac running all of the tests, right? Who would want to contribute to that? So we can use DPE to encourage code contributions to our projects, right? If we actually focus on engineering a better experience for our contributors, it stands to reason that we will get more contributors, right? If our project is easier to work on, more people will work on our project. And it really helps OSS projects move even faster. I, I really think that even though, you know, the focus of Gradle Enterprise is on the enterprise, and we spend a lot of time helping businesses with their builds, there's way more advantages to doing this stuff with an open source project, because you can be very public about what you're doing, right? And open source projects already tend to have a faster velocity than a commercial project, because there's less barriers to, uh, to productivity because you have more people working on them, because there's less sensitivity regulation, all these wonderful things that we already know about how it is to work on an open project. But DPE can make it move even faster, right, by unsticking the technical barriers to making the project more successful. It manages contributor expectations. All right, go back to Kafka, or go back to any project where it's 4.30 in the afternoon and you're thinking about contributing. Wouldn't it be great to know exactly how long it's gonna take to build? Wouldn't it be really nice to just have an interface that says, oh, guess what, the last 
2,000 builds of this project took eight minutes. You know, at the very least, it's validating. You know, if you're hitting that 15 minute mark and everybody else has been hitting eight, you, you know, some, something's probably going on that you, should, that you should look into, right? But it helps manage expectations for what it should actually feel like. What is the developer experience of working on this open source project, right? So DPE can improve that too. It can increase project adoption rates. When I was at Open Logic, one of the services that we offered was to certify a piece of community open source for uh, production use. And we had a 72 point process that we would go through. But a lot of those criteria had to do with how many developers are working on this project. How often is this project being built, right? Because that's almost always an indication of how quickly bugs and security and patches and things like that are gonna be um, are going to be responded to, right? And all of these are things that gives an enterprise or a large business more confidence in adopting a, a community piece of open source. And if we're maintaining an open source project, that's our target, right? We, we want widespread adoption and we want enterprises and big businesses to feel comfortable using our product if that's where it's targeted because that's how these projects become lucrative and successful for the, for the maintainers. So, uh, I mentioned before that we've given this DPE technology, this platform, to a number of different open source projects. Uh, this is, I think, the current list of all of them. We may have added, oh, we just added a new one called Defect, but, you know, Spring, Kotlin, the Open Telemetry Project, I've seen several talks about Open Telemetry, JHipster, Micronaut, Test Containers um, is using our stuff, Rat Pack, Hibernate, JUnit 5. Uh, and the nice thing about all this is that this data these are all live projects, you know, running against our, our little dashboard that's doing all those, those things that I mentioned we should be doing around DPE, accelerating builds, capturing data about the time it takes to, for builds to complete, flaky test detection, failure analytics, and it's all there for anybody who wants to, to, to poke through. So if you need some inspiration, if you're thinking, okay, maybe I do want to do a little bit of this, maybe this is making sense a little bit, but I don't really necessarily know where to start. Well, I already told you where to start, track local build times, right? Find that one out first, because that really will be the foundation for the ROI for everything else that you end up doing with this. Um, but then get inspired by the other stuff that you see in these dashboards. Your Springs dashboard, you know, you can see that they're uh, avoiding about an hour and 15 minutes. Again, that's not wall clock, that's serial time saving but an hour and 15 minutes on average per build. Um, Josh Long and I are, are, are buds and, and, and he talks about how much this changed the, the way that he's been able to work on Spring Boot and how much the Spring community have been able to, uh, to improve you know, the way that they work on this uh, as a result of, of adopting DPE. In fact, I just did uh, a podcast episode about DPE with Josh two months ago. If you're, if you're a fan of his stuff, go on his Bootiful podcast. Uh, and I wanna say it was month and a half ago we talked about this stuff. It was a really good talk. I mean, I always love talking to Josh, but uh, the Kotlin project too uh, is building against uh, Gradle Enterprise right now or, or adopting DP, I should say. Of course it is. Like Kotlin exists for developer productivity. Who's familiar with Kotlin? Played with it much? Kotlin's really cool, all right? So for any old Java heads who got really tired of public static, void, main, arg, array, and just to be able to you know, bootstrap a single project, Kotlin gives you much more reduced syntax. Fun main arg string, or array string, that's it. And when you compile it using the Kotlin compiler, it creates a Java class, so it's Java bytecode. If you decompile that bytecode, you will find highly opinionated Java. So it's actually super cool. You can see there, you can actually see there and look and see exactly what Kotlin is doing for you. Uh, so you can trust it, but it also will make you more productive. It's a much more reduced syntax. So it only makes sense that, you know, this would be another thing that we would consider to be part of the big tent of productivity engineering. I really want to stress that. Uh, the bar is basically, are you leaning on people to be more productive, or are you improving your technology to be more productive? If you're leaning on people, you're basically just doing productivity management. Not a bad thing. Plenty of good productivity management strategies and techniques and stuff, but that's not developer productivity engineering, right? We're really talking about the technology. We're using engineering principles to keep developers happier and more productive as a result. So things like GitHub Copilot, is that DPE? Totally, right? We're using technology to eliminate the amount of toil that, that developers have to experience to do their jobs, right? So I don't want to, uh, I don't want you to leave this 
thinking that DPE is only limited to the value propositions around Gradle Enterprise, because that's not the case, right? DPE is a, is a wide field and you're starting to see a lot of different companies identify under it. Undo, they have a time traveling debugger, time traveling debugger for C, which is a super cool thing, and they're, they're calling what they're doing developer productivity engineering, and they're absolutely right. Um, Build Buddy, Launchable, Engflow, some of these other companies are calling it DPE, uh, because it is. So just because it's not something that's directly addressed by Gradle doesn't mean that it isn't DPE. I wanna make sure that's understood. Yeah, Gradle and Maven coming soon. Sue, it's some coming soon. All right, so some final steps, some final thoughts. How are we time was? Oh, we even have time for questions, look at that. Uh, there is a book for this. Uh, it's in its second revision. You'll see the Gradle logo on the front, and that's it. You will not see the Gradle logo anywhere else. Uh, in the book, it is vendorless and vendor agnostic, as it is meant to be. Um, you know, full disclosure, we have sellers that go out and sell Gradle Enterprise. They work for Gradle Inc., that's what they do. My job is to evangelize developer productivity engineering. My criteria is different. I mean, full disclosure, I wanna see a Gartner Magic Quadrant on this practice a few years from now with tens if not hundreds of people considering to be in this space, right? And I think that it's, I think, I think the time is right. I think, like if you look at um, the Gartner CEO surveys that's come out over the last couple of years, the 2020 Gartner CEO survey listed developer experience in the single digits in terms of being top of mind or a concern for CEOs. By 2022, only two years later, it's in the 70s. So it went from single digit concern at the CEO level to over 70% concern in just two years, right? We, we really are starting to shift and think about developer experience and developer productivity. So, so I really do think this is the time for it. The nice thing too is that you haven't missed the boat. If you've never heard about this before today, guess what? Netflix only started doing this like six years ago and they're like front of the pack, right? So you really haven't missed the boat. This is still very much an emerging practice. Um, I mentioned too that we've got these 17 some odd projects if you wanna pick through their dashboards, see the kind of data that they're collecting. Uh, this is where that page is. Um, if you lose this for some reason, you can always just go to gradle.com, go to our customers, we'll have an open source projects site on there and you can get to the same little portal. But you can pick around in Spring's dashboard or Hibernate's dashboard or Micronaut's dashboard and just kind of get some inspiration for, for, for what they're doing and maybe think about like how your organization or your open source community or whomever you want to bring this back to could, could be utilizing some of that same data. Uh, if you want to try a build scan, scans.griddle.com. And uh, yeah, that's it. So um, we do have a couple of minutes for questions though. Yeah. I really, really agree with you. I think this stuff is very important. Thank you. It's a great question. Um, DX uh, is a company that sprung up pretty recently around the JavaScript uh, world. Uh, they, it's, that's called, oh, just like groups of people who care about this stuff. That's hard, to be honest with you. Um, like we launched this DPE summit and it was the first productivity summit of its time and we got all this interest because there was, there was nothing else, right? It's not like we were competing theme-wise for anything, thematically for anything. We have a, Two seconds. We, One second, Karen, over here. Oh, dagger. Who, dagger. All right, yeah, come, come see us. For sure. I, oh, well, you know what, and I mean, so part of what I'm trying to spin up this year now that I've got this whole new advocacy team is a whole partner advocacy channel where we could be working with companies like yours on go-to-market, doing talks together and things like that. So let's, yeah, let's definitely talk about that. Yeah, so there you go, guy right behind you. Um, we have a pretty vibrant community in our Gradle Slack in our Gradle community Slack, which is open to everybody, totally public. Uh, there's a section in there called Developer Productivity Engineering. Uh, you can join the conversation. There's usually some good stuff going on in there. And the interesting thing is that you get, like you can talk to the Netflix productivity engineers. You can talk to the Square productivity engineers. You can talk to the Uber productivity, like they're there. They're, they're sitting there in that Slack, right? So you can really talk to some of the folks who are dealing with some of the biggest productivity problems in the world. Any other questions? Um, another thing too that again, if this was compelling in any way, I love coming in and talking to teams about this kind of stuff. Um, you know, do lunch and learn, something like that. So again, if this is something where you think, oh, I'd love to get a few teammates on a Zoom and, and you know, hear this or, or some version of this uh, that you think might be useful, come grab a card. It's definitely a thing I love to do. All right.
Thank you. Thanks.